Welcome to our channel, so glad you're with us. And many of you are artists, filmmakers, professors of art, and pastors who care about the culture you live in, as well as the creatives in your community. Thank you for joining us. Don't stop creating, don't stop encouraging the creatives around you to be salt and light right where God has planted them. Now, today I want to talk about this cultural obsession with self-creation. If you've been paying attention to where our culture is going, you probably noticed that our culture has moved from emphasizing self-expression to promoting self-creation. What does this mean for our view of art and artists and culture and even creativity? That's what we're going to talk about right now. Welcome, I'm Joel Pelsu, president of Arts Entertainment Ministries. Our passion is helping you as a creative professional to succeed in your creative life while growing deeper in your spiritual walk because your creativity and your spirituality are designed by God to work in concert with one another. And that's our passion. If that's your passion, take a second to like and subscribe to our channel, share it with your friends. Oh, and before we jump in, I want to let you know we have online courses for you about your calling as an artist. We'll soon be launching a brand new course for artists and creatives to help them launch their career and to grow their creative business. So check that out. Sign up for our emails. You'll be the first to know when we're ready to launch it later this year. The links will all be down below. Check those out when you finish the video. Now today we're talking about self-creation, and if you're following along in our Artist Identity series, you may remember the first video is on self-expression. Self-expression is wonderful. We should seek to be authentic and use unique gifts and talents God has given us. But as we saw in that video, there's more to your life and your art than just expressing yourself. There's a deeper, more profound way of living and a more satisfying way to look at the art media you create than just self-expression. So if you haven't watched that video, I encourage you to check that out. But today we're talking about an idea that is one step beyond self-expression, and that is self-creation. In this framework, it's not enough to have a unique perspective or unique voice. It's not enough to celebrate your heritage, your family, or stories that inspire you. No, the new goal is self-creation. Because the conviction is that you should not be held back by what the culture says about you. You shouldn't be held back by what other people say about you. And you shouldn't even be held back by anything you don't like about yourself. So don't accept it. Create a new persona and then choose a path of creating your new self. And to be fair, most people wouldn't mind changing at least one thing about themselves. So embracing the idea that you can make those changes sounds empowering. But we need to take time to investigate what this looks like in real life and what the consequences might be for embracing such an idea. First, to get a clear understanding of the concept, let's take a look at the origin of self-creation. I'm not going to go in depth on this, but it is important to know where the ideas come from and the core thinkers on this subject, which are Jean-Paul Sartre, Friedrich Nietzsche, and Carl Rogers. Now, Nietzsche is the first, uh, chronologically, historically, he gave us the idea of the Ubermensch or Superman and the challenge to get beyond cultural limitations, morals, folkways, all these things that everyone else is bound to. He believed that we need to move beyond being merely human and become something greater which is expressed in his quote, man is a rope tied between beast and overman, or ubermensch, a rope over an abyss. He talks about the need to move beyond restriction of society and cultural norms. Then comes along Jean-Paul Sartre, the philosopher who claims that for human beings, existence comes before essence. Now, if you're not a philosopher, this may not ring a bell, but in other words, our very nature is something we create. And Sartre reversed the other philosophers statements they'd stated before him that your nature is first your essence is grounded in reality and that tells you something about yourself as you move into the world and create but Sartre did not believe in God or a creator he claimed we're alone it's up to you create your own reality chart your own story there's no one external giving you any help or guidance there's no design so you create your own identity a famous line by Sartre is the line, we are condemned to be free. Highlighting the great weight of responsibility accompanying such a view of freedom. If you can create anything, and indeed that is your goal, your job, then all the responsibility falls on you for everything in your life. You create meaning, you create the story, you create your identity. Everything falls on you. There's no given, there's no starting point where someone else tells you anything. It all lies in your hands. And the last one is Carl Rogers, the humanistic psychologist. Now, Rogers established the idea of self-actualization, 
on ideas built upon Maslow's hierarchy and a few other problems with Maslow's hierarchy, besides the fact that he's a horribly low view of art and artists and creativity and beauty, you can check our blog out on Maslow on our website. I'll put a link down below. But for now, it will suffice to clarify that Carl Rogers promoted a kind of self-help approach to life based on a humanistic view. There is no God. There's no creator. There's no other source of meaning. It's all upon you to improve yourself by taking care of your physical needs, emotional needs, psychological needs. Notice, beauty and art don't even show up. They're not that important, which does not reflect reality or how people live. There are a bunch of problems with this view. But the idea is that we're on our own in a world where there is no God. Our hope is in our ability to improve ourselves all by ourselves. So the founders of this idea of self-creation were all atheists who placed all their hope within the human heart, mind, and soul, hoping we could fix ourselves. The question always arises for such thinkers, how can we fix ourselves if we don't even know what it looks like to become whole or fixed? There's not a true measuring stick or a marker of wholeness to compare. So what's the goal? See, this is part of the Achilles heel of self-creation and these philosophies but I want to break it down in more detail. First, what is the promise of self-creation? The promise is that you are free. You do not need to be confined by traditions of the past. You do not need to be confined by the cultural assumptions of your parents, of your church, of your environment. You don't need to be confined what other people say, right? And the promise of self-creation is profound, but then we need to ask ourselves, what is the challenge in self-creation? Well, every day, pressure is completely on you to self-create. Don't settle. Don't accept what others say or do or copy someone else. Every day, the pressure is completely upon you to reject other narratives and norms offered to you. And every day, the pressure is there to be radically innovative. And so we ask ourselves, <laughs> how are you going to do that? And this brings us to what is the curse of self-creation? The curse is this. You will never arrive. There is no contentment. How would you know if you finished your self-creation project? You see, there's no metric you can use. There's no comparison to satisfy. There's no finish line. There's no contentment, no peace, no true satisfaction. It never ends. Every day your job is to create something new of yourself that is set apart from goals of everyone else. You dare not copy someone else. That would be a cop-out or slavery to someone else's goals, ambitions, concerns. It's an incredible burden to be 100% unique all the time. And if you take it seriously, then you should design your own clothes and probably don't use pants and shirts or dresses. Create something new. You shouldn't use makeup the way people do. You shouldn't do hair the way people do. These are all constructs and conventions. You should challenge everything because everything is helping, holding you back from creating yourself as completely original. You see the challenges here, the curse, the weight that comes upon you if you fully embrace this. And often people embrace it to a point and then uh, they get the value and the, the reaction from the crowd or from the patrons and they're done. And so they don't really continue all the way. They continue until it works for marketing and until it gets the shock value, something else. They don't follow it to its logical conclusion. It's too much weight. And what does this look like today? It often begins with self-expression through what we wear, what we possess, which is then used by people to create a persona or a facade. And you use it in your marketing. You use it in your social media when you go on tour. And those are fine things. Have fun. Make a statement. That's great. And most people stop here. It's a marketing mechanism, not a lifelong pursuit. For others, this is where the journey begins. Rather than just playing a role or an actor playing a part, they embrace this identity for a season, maybe like Beyonce and her alter ego, Sasha Fierce, which is an alter ego. She says she is retired, so it was useful for a season, dealing with her shyness and other things. There's a lot more going on there, plenty of videos unpacking that, but it was for a season that she created a version of herself. For others, it can also progress to the point of some people changing their body through plastic surgery, trying to alter their very identity. You see this in musicians getting hardware put in their head or different things they're doing to change their cheekbones or something to look like an animal or whatever it can be. Now people are changing their sex organs or trying to change their gender. Because once you accept the philosophical idea of self-creation, where do you stop? As they say in philosophical arguments, there is no limiting principle to this argument. 
this philosophy. What if you wish you were a robot, or a car, or a planet? And where does this idea become obviously ludicrous? Never to them, because logic and reality are constructs to be manipulated, not accepted, or respected. But reality has a funny way of catching up with us, no matter what we do. It especially catches up with poorly constructed philosophies. You see, at some point, we run head on into the reality that we're human and we are limited. We cannot just will into existence anything we desire. Even sex changes result in sterilization. You can never have kids now. You've destroyed something that was functioning. You've permanently lost something precious about being human and the way God made us. And this brings us to the harsh, cold truth. You cannot become anything you want. And we, we know this. Even a child knows this. Short people cannot play in the NBA. People with slow reflexes, I'm too old, you're not going to compete in eSports. You need the reflexes of a young person. And fat people are not going to become spelunkers and cave explorers. You need to get through those tight little openings. Right now, I can't fit. I can't do it. We are limited by our physicality. We have limits. We have blessings and gifts and abilities and limitations. That's part of being human. It's part of reality. And we cannot change our DNA or our chromosomes. No matter how much you desire it, you cannot change this fact. But this is not a reason to despair, as Sartre or Nietzsche might. On the contrary, it's a reason to wake up and admit the theory doesn't work. Like scientists finally admitting Copernicus was right and giving up on the whole idea that the Earth was the center of the planetary system. Only then could astronomers begin to propose new theories that actually made sense and reflected the true path of the planets as they orbited the sun. In the same manner, once you realize the truth of your body and soul, your limitations, you can open your eyes to a more beautiful and more meaningful approach to life that actually works. So what is the better approach? First, your desire for freedom is the right desire. But if you buy into self-creation as a solution, you've accepted a cheap substitute for a deeper, more satisfying answer. You see, yes, freedom is what we all long for, but it is not freedom from social constructs. It's not freedom from religion. It's not even freedom from traditions and cultural norms. What we long for is freedom deep within our souls. The bad news is that you can't fix that with self-creation. The good news, there's already a powerful solution. Listen to this verse from an ancient letter to people in Galatia. It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Galatians 5.1. That's dealing with Judaizers and we get into the context. But the point is, there's a path to freedom and Christ did not die for you to be a slave to always pushing, always achieving, always this endless rat race is not what you're designed to do. So it's clear is two truths. First, there's real spiritual slavery. And second, there is a path to real freedom. What we need to do is step back and look at life, look at creation, and realize the truth, and we are not the center of the universe. Clearly, someone created the universe and everything in it. It's too complicated, too well designed to think it came out of nowhere. If you, you look at my watch, you take it apart, you look at this computer, there's no way this evolved out of nowhere. It took an intelligent being to design it, to assemble it, to put it together. Creation is so much more complex. The universe is so much more complex. I don't have the faith to believe that just happened. I take too much faith uh, for these evolutionists to think just happened. I, 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 I find that unreasonable. Anyway, Genesis tells us God created all this and then invited you and me to be a part of taking care of this creation. Now, we screwed it up, and so we have this God-shaped hole in our soul, because we sin, which separates us from God. We have this hole in our soul that acts like a homing device for heaven, for perfect freedom in community and being loved, for relationship with God. That's what your heart's crying out for. And once we recognize these truths, then you can begin to live as the artist or creative person God designed you to be, embracing your gifts and calling and finding a deeper meaning to your life, because you are connected to the meaning maker, God himself. You see, God placed within your heart a longing to be more and to do more. That's real. That's from God. But that's not frustrated by constructs. It's frustrated by sin and guilt in your life. So naturally, there are times when we feel like there's so much more to life. There's so much more to do and be. Yes, he has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. 
Ecclesiastes 3.11b, or the second half of the verse. But the entire weight is not placed upon your shoulders during the brief years you have on this earth. Why? Because it is not only about you. It's about something much bigger of which you're invited to play a part. What you long for is to be free of the brokenness in this world. What you also long for is a freedom from guilt and shame and sorrow. And so you long to connect with a transcendent being that is infinitely more beautiful, majestic, holy, and true than you have dared to imagine. And this is a good desire. Are you unique? Yes, of course. We're all uniquely made by God, knit together in the womb. We have different skin tones, voices, shapes, sizes, male and female. This variety is a gift from God to be celebrated. We're not meant to be carbon copies of someone else or automatons. Will you have limitations in this world? Yes. But your hope is not in your ability to do psychological gymnastics or personal self-improvement marathons. No. Hope is found in letting your creativity be inspired and led by God. Oh, one last thing. Freedom is not the absence of restrictions. I'll leave a link to our blog on freedom where we talk about this. But as Stravinsky said, he was very cutting edge. He said, there's no freedom without boundaries. See, boundaries and restrictions give us the opportunity to focus on what can be done within those boundaries. Every song has boundaries, whether it's the chord progressions you choose, the melody, the feeling you want to create. All of those restrict your other choices. Each painting is bound by the materials you use and the type of painting you want to paint. You cannot do cubism and photorealistic representational art at the same time. And filmmakers and video game developers, too. You're limited by the equipment and software available. But also consider you cannot make a game that is completely open world and completely linear. You've got to pick one or pick segments where you do one or the other. And you need to choose what kind of game you're making before you can even begin. To not choose would be paralyzing. So you see, creativity, art, and entertainment all require choices that restrict our options, not endless freedom. And those choices limit some freedom while channeling our creativity in such a way that we begin to experience more freedom in the process. It's the same with your life. How you experience creativity and your art is the same way you should look at your life. You do not gain more freedom by ignoring the way you're designed. Any more than making a great painting is by ignoring the fact that you started it in a cubist fashion or ignoring that you're playing a 12-bar blues and play some classical uh, approach to this or some atonal uh, melody over the top of blues. You just ruin the song. You can't ignore the design of a work of art as you create it, right? So freedom is not by ignoring the way you're designed. On the contrary, we experience freedom when we recognize our design and our purpose. Then we begin to feel alive in such a way that we understand this is fulfilling a purpose. It's my old jazz mentor, John Rapson, used to talk about in Proverbs. This is Bring up a child in the way it should go. And this is true for an artist. Continue an artwork in the way it should go. You start a work of art and you see something. You're writing a novel, you're experiencing the characters, and you see, oh, it needs to go this way. And you follow the limitations and the boundaries and the restrictions that you've already created as you started the project. You, you create a melody or a jazz improvisation in a way that fits the song. You create characters in a way that fit the video game and you direct your actors in a way that fit the film. Is it a comedy? Is it a rom-com? Is it, you know, sci-fi, whatever. You direct the actors to fit that. Not, you have freedom to do whatever you want. You can be comedic and silly in the middle of a heavy drama. No, you just violated the art piece. You see, everywhere you go, freedom is found in listening to the boundaries, focusing on them, and utilizing them. That's where we need to focus on how to fulfill the purpose God has given us, just like how it works in our art. And this is the beauty of what is offered in the Bible and in the gospel. You don't have to face endless so-called constructs to deconstruct and obliterate. No, you find the freedom you long for in living the way God designed you to live. And you can experience great creative freedom by recognizing how you're designed. What are your gifts? What are your gifts designed for? What are your talents? And a great starting place is our Artist Calling Masterclass. It can give you some basic concepts, categories that will help you see the beauty of being called by God as a creative. It's in relationship. It's helped so many creatives. It's a great resource. Just click on the link down below. Now, if this video is helpful to you, great. I encourage you to watch some of our other videos, especially our video series called Christianity 
and creativity. You can use the link down below. And if you enjoyed this, check out our website or online courses by clicking one of the links down below. And please take a second, hit the like button and subscribe. As always, I pray that God blesses you and equips you to be salt and light in a world that desperately needs it. You can check out another one of our videos right here. We have lots of videos here on YouTube. We have articles on art and faith on our website. Use those resources. Be encouraged. Take advantage of all that we've created to encourage you and bless you as a creative or as an academic teaching art or even as clergy encouraging and supporting artists. Share these with your friends. Have a great day. God bless.